Chapter 13 of our textbook gets into some more applied areas. We're looking at specific controls that can help us ensure that information is processed correctly. So this is kind of a shorter chapter, but it has a lot of really relevant elements that I think will probably help you out in your projects as we go throughout the class. Now, first thing, there's a really nice article I have linked here that I think is fun to kind of go through a little bit. But this one is a lady that talks about error detection codes. Now, it seems kind of um, you know, technical to begin with, but as she gets a little bit further, you'll see she starts talking about how to find errors when we, we type things in. So as a basic example, you think about barcodes, right? So these are just things you hit with scanners. Well, one of the things you'll do is that barcodes actually have an error correcting code built in. And the idea is this, is that we have a couple of digits on a number that basically verify that the prior few were actually correct. You can see there's other areas as well, like Visa card numbers. Uh, you might have typed in your Visa card number on a website before, and the website says this is an invalid number. Well, how does it know that? Well, we use these kind of error correcting detection or error correcting codes to automatically detect when people type in their values incorrectly. So these are some of the examples of what I can find, what I can't find, some of the different techniques that are available. But it's kind of a nice little uh, article summarizing this idea. So for this, we're going to look at what are some things to ensure that we process data correctly. And we'll talk about some controls that can help minimize downtime. Now, there's a lot of these kind of forms that you see in your normal everyday life that you may not have noticed. One of the examples is forms. So I know checks are not that common these days, but if you think about a checkbook, you'll see that each check has a sequential number on it. And the idea there is you don't want anyone to be able to duplicate a check, and if you have a unique ID for each one, it's easier to track and control these. One form you probably have seen is a turnaround document. A turnaround document is a, usually a bill that's sent to your house by some company like AT&T or Verizon or something like that. And they will have pre-printed information on your account, the date, how much you owe, and often they'll even have a pre-addressed envelope. And the idea there is that if you just send them a random check, they don't know what account to apply that to. But by giving the invoice, you return the invoice with your payment, and then they have all the information to key it in the check and apply the balance to the proper account. You'll often see source documents are controlled in a lot of organizations. Um, you, and that's another way of saying that we make sure that people don't get unauthorized access. So for example, if you write a check, you might say, oh, I, I made a mistake on this one. You'll write void on it. And that's a way to make sure that uh, you will save that check, and that way no one can reissue that same one. So here are some examples. We have things as simple as fields. Uh, are characters in a field the proper type? So say you have a gender field and you want to accept the value of M or F in it. Well, you would put a check on that to make sure you can't put in zero or a question mark. Sign checks are making sure data is positive or negative as appropriate. So for example, here, you might have a check when you enter a debit or a credit that the numbers are only positive. Range checks, you might have a lower and upper limit for a certain value. So say, for example, your age, you might have age being a valid option from 0 to, say, 120. Size, make sure that all the data fits into the field. So a exa good example here would be for addresses. You might have a state field. It might only want to have two characters. And so you make sure that someone can't type in you know, West Virginia, W-E-S, and then they, the S will kick out because it's too long. Completeness, make sure you have all fields before anything is accepted. And so an example here might be with an address to not accept a street without a city or a state. Validity checks a record against a master file. So this might be uh, if you send a payment to AT&T, they're going to verify that you are a customer with them before they're going to take the payment and apply it. Reasonableness check, you might think about this as sort of saying that if you live in West Virginia, you should have one of the cities that is also in West Virginia. And then you've got a check digit. A check digit can be as simple as adding all the numbers together and seeing if it's even or odd. Uh, it could be more advanced like with a Visa card or there's other schemes that are out there as well. Other things you can do, uh, like we talked about sequencing, when you do a batch process, Batch basically means I don't do real-time. Instead, I put all of these updates together and process 
them at once. And so if you have a company with purchase orders, for example, you might say that you process purchase orders every Friday. You take all of the purchase orders in, you put them in sequence, and you process them in order. You often will use batch totals for other purposes to check as well. So this might be things like financial totals, like making sure net income equals you know, revenue minus expenses. It could be a hash total, where we just add together all of the numbers and make sure that they match. Or even a record count saying, I think I've got eight sales, so I should have eight new rows in the database table this period. Other possible matching, uh, other possible processing controls are data matching. Uh, so with matching, you might think about this with a purchase order, a sales order, shipping, invoicing, you know, all those sorts of documents with the revenue cycle, making sure they go together before you issue a check. Cross-footing is a standard technique. That says we look at a spreadsheet and you're not always 100% sure that the rows and columns are totaled properly. And so you'll basically do the same calculation twice in a different way to see if you get the same result. Another way to check things is with a zero balance test. So for payroll each month, you might have a special account set up for payroll and you only allow money to be transferred in that should be coming out. And so basically that account should clear to zero at the end of each period. Write protection mechanisms might be there to make sure you don't accidentally erase or write over information. So for example, uh, not allowing pencils on checks, you only allow pens. And then concurrent update controls are there to make sure that people don't wipe each, out, wipe each other's data out. So if you have a shared Google Doc, uh, make sure that people aren't editing the same part of the document at the same time. Output. What are some things we can do to make sure the output goes correctly? Well, one basic idea is just use your review. So this is basically like a receipt that you get. Uh, you know, you check out at the grocery store, the grocer checks, hands you a receipt, and you make sure that all of the items are on the receipt. We have reconciliation procedures. So we're gonna make sure that control accounts, like the general AR account, matches the specific subsidiary ledgers. In other words, the account for each company that we uh, are gonna receive money from. Also really important is external data reconciliation. So we'll do this in one of our simulations where you wanna make sure that your cash balance in your accounting records is gonna match the cash balance in the bank. And if those two match, then you're in good shape. If there's an error, then you wanna check into that. We use a variety of controls when we transmit data, but this is more like a kind of a networking class with checksum or parity, so you don't need to worry too much about that. Uh, we can also look at blockchain as another example of this. I think blockchain is largely overhyped, so we're not going to talk about it a lot. Uh, but basically, it's another way you can kind of try and verify that stuff isn't changed in transit. So with availability, you want to make sure that we keep our systems up as much as possible and recover quickly if anything goes down. There's a whole range of different specific things we can do to help this work. One of the key ones is preventative maintenance. So this might be replacing computers on a regular basis, making sure every server is up to date. We'll use fault tolerance. Fault tolerance means that we build our system so that there's backups for stuff. So one example is with servers, you might often design or buy a server that has redundant power supplies. That way, if one of the power supplies fails, the computer can still operate. Our data centers are built with a lot of availability controls built into them. So one thing we have is like raised floors. We can route cables more easily. We'll have specialized air conditioning to keep the room cool. And often you'll have duplicates of that as well. We'll have special supplies for power to make sure we never lose power for the room. Um, surge control, all that kind of thing. But there's a lot of controls we use to make sure data centers are properly handled. User training, patch management. All right, backups. Backups are important. We have a couple different varieties of this. For example, we have incremental, which only copies items that have changed since your last partial backup, or differential. And I'm not gonna make a big difference between these two here. Basically, you have kind of partial backups for each of these or full backup. And practically what this means is, if you've got a very large database, it might take hours and hours and hours to back it up to an external device. And so you might have a daily backup that just does new files Disaster recovery plans are also important. The idea here is what do you do to prepare in advance for a disaster happening? Uh, you, really what you'll find is that if you haven't tested your disaster recovery, that it's probably not working correctly. Um, I used to help out at my dad's small business, 
And one time I came into the office after being gone for a month or two and found that of the four different backup methods I'd implemented, all but one had failed. And, but you don't know that until you actually test them out. You also have business continuity plans. And you often see the term hot site and cold site. Hot site means I can switch from a primary location to a secondary location with almost no gap. So big companies like Amazon or e-commerce companies where every minute matters will put the extra money in to have these hot sites. Most businesses, though, the cost isn't really worth it. So you'll have what's called a cold site. A cold site says, I plan for this to come online, but I'm not actually going to keep it ready to go to reduce some cost to a reasonable level. And most businesses can handle a couple of days of, down in, of downtime without having catastrophic results. All right, so in class, we're going to talk about specific controls and how to mitigate threats. So think through the list that we have here and try to match them to some of the problems that we're showing in the slides. There's a lot of key terms here. I'll try again to focus on the key ones that I've highlighted as being important for the particular class. So hopefully this gives you some examples of some processing controls that can make your life better. It gets very kind of applied at this point. Um, so it really helps if you try to take these and then apply them to your own particular problems. So think about the systems we're building for class here. How can you use these kind of controls to make sure that they're working properly? And that'll help you kind of get these uh, to stick in your mind.